This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. A look back and ahead as one of Stock Car Racing's marquee events prepares for its 50th anniversary, the Snowball Derby on this edition of In Studio. In 2017, the engines will fire on the 50th year of what has become one of short track stock car racing's most prestigious races, the Snowball Derby. The race is held each December at Pensacola, Florida's Five Flag Speedway. It is known in the racing world as one of the best and most competitive races in the nation. It has made heroes out of local drivers and humbled some of NASCAR's biggest names. The high banked half mile oval racetrack is lightning fast and the asphalt surface is no friend to tires, which means driver skill is at a premium. Our guests on this edition of In Studio will share their perspective on the historic relevance and the future of the Snowball Derby. Wayne Niedekin Jr. is a second generation racer. His father won the Snowball twice, including the inaugural event. Junior Niedekin is a fan favorite with an impressive resume. He has 12 track championships from speedways throughout the Southeast. His best snowball finish was second, but he has consistently run well. He is third in all time top 10 finishes. He is still an active driver and is the owner of Niedekin Motorsports, which specializes in construction, fabrication, and maintenance of race cars, as well as consulting and driver development. When Dickie Davis started racing at Five Flags Speedway, his day job was that of an Escambia County Deputy Sheriff. His fellow competitors learned, in addition to chasing criminals, he was pretty good at chasing down checkered flags. Davis is now retired, but before doing so, he collected two <clears throat> Snowball Derby trophies in 1971 and 1973. Seven times Tim Bryant raced in the Snowball Derby, but these days he runs the show. Bryant and his family began managing Five Flag Speedway, home to the Snowball Derby, in 2004. They purchased the track in 2007. In addition to the Speedway, the family owns Bryant Racing Equipment, which supplies tires and parts to race teams. Gordon Paulus covered the Snowball Derby for a decade and a half as sports editor of the Pensacola News Journal. Paulus is well respected by fans and competitors for his knowledge of the sport and his ability to bring to the printed page the action and drama of short track stock car racing. In recent years, Paulus moved into corporate communications for the Gulf Power Company, but remains a fan and an expert on racing. Gentlemen, welcome. What a pleasure to have you all with me. I'm going to begin with you, Tim, because I know so many people are probably going to ask the question, you're in Florida, you had a race, why would you call it a snowball? How did the snowball derby <laughs> in Florida come about? <laughs> well, we certainly have to uh, pass that question on uh, to the now deceased Tom Dawson, who we always are quick to give credit uh, for, for inventing and, and coming up with the snowball derby. In 1968, he moved from Ohio and uh, came to Pensacola, purchased Five Flag Speedway. Uh, as I'm told, the, uh, the name Snowball Derby came from a snowmobile event that he was familiar with, with uh, back in Ohio. So uh, he held the first event in, in 1968, and, and now here we are 49 years later. It rarely snows, but occasionally it snows in Pensacola. Has it ever snowed on Snowball Derby weekend? It's been pretty cold, but I don't believe we've had any <laughs> snow yet. Vicki Davis, how did you get in the racing business? Well, I was sitting in Nick Elliott's service station back in 1968 when Tom Dawson came to Pensacola. He's from Ohio. He purchased a track for $80,000, $85,000 from Miss Williams. And he was trying to line up people to build race cars to go ro racing. So he came by Nick Elliott's service station, so we got to talking. And Ronnie Joyce was there at the same time. And so, anyway, we got to talking, and I went down the street and bought a 57 Ford from a woman down the street, bought her a car, and brought it up there. So we built us a race car, and we started racing and for Tom Dawson out there in 68, and that's how I got started with that aspect of the asphalt and five flags. Junior, you started off very young, but tell me your story. Your dad won the first Snowball Derby. Do you remember that? Uh, very well. It was uh, very cold that day, and I remember Dad getting out of the car. He had a uh, maroon-looking jacket on. It was looked almost purple, and he was about the same color as that jacket because they didn't have windshields in the cars that, that day. 
Uh, and if memory serves me right, cautions did not count, and it was like a marathon event, and it, they probably run two, three hundred laps for a hundred lap race, and uh, just extremely cold. Yeah, your dad won it twice. What did he tell you the biggest challenge was about that race over the years? Well, dad was always a savvy racer. He took care of his stuff. He laid back. He managed his car, his tires, and his equipment, and uh, had something to race with at the end. And I've always tried to mentor that in my racing is take care of your stuff. And a lot of that comes from paying for your own equipment <laughs> and fixing your own race car. Right. And uh, when you do that, it teaches you that discipline to take care of your stuff, be around at the end, and try to have, I always call it, if you had your fenders on and your tires straight, you had a bullet to shoot at the end, you might win. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I've always tried to race like that. How old were you when you started? I was 17 years old when I started racing, and uh, when I started racing, there were no radios, and we run, I'd say I run up to early 80s without radios, and it was just you, you know, and uh, I had never raced anything, not even go-karts, when I started racing, and I started in a late model. I was going to start in the spectator division and dad had an air tank explode on him in 1974 and Dickie uh, drove dad's car several times there and in that span while dad was in recovery and all and uh, it was just uh, that kind of threw that out the window because it was a special engine. You had to be able to run that car. You could run the same car, right? just a lesser motor, and I don't know what the weights and all were back then, but it moved me back to starting in a late model, and I started in 1975, and I want to say my first event, they had Sunday afternoon races back then. They'd start early, and I want to say it was like just after February and the start of March, and they'd have a couple 50-lap shows on Sundays, and you'd have everybody here. Yeah. And when I mean everybody, you had half a NASCAR out of Hueytown would be here, and the regulars like Lolly and Bob Fry. I don't know if Bob Fry was still running at that time, but Bad Brand, and you'd have Lindley occasionally, Butch Lindley occasionally, Freddie Fry would be here, Dickie, you know, all the all the hot shoes <laughs> would be here, and there, there would be about 20 of those guys that's capable of winning. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm a snotty-nosed kid in a race car with no radio trying to figure this all out. And uh, I'm staying on the bottom trying to stay out of the way. And they'd just suck the paint off every time they'd come by. You got, I got lapped probably four or five times my first race. And, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty good awakening. Uh, I bet. I bet. Gordon, tell people who may not fully understand what the Snowball Derby means to the racing community. You're a journalist. you covered it for many years. What, what, what does it mean to the racing community? Well, if it's just local short track racing at its best, you know, because that was the one race that was at the end of the year. There was no other races going on. So everyone came down, even in the old days when NASCAR, you know, you know the, the, Bill ba the Buddy Bakers and the Pearsons and the Allisons came down. And it's just... Uh, you know, it's amazing how Tim has, you know, took over the track in 04, and it's just, it's actually gotten bigger in the last, I think, 10 years, and it's just become a phenomenon with, you know, Speed 51 also doing the coverage, and just uh, people coming down, taking their vacations here for a week, you know, coming from Canada, California, all over the, you know, the nation, and it's just, uh, you know, it's the race to go to in December. I know my first snowball derby was in 75, and they would stick numbers on the side of your car as you come through the gate. And I had 107 on my car. Right. And I couldn't tell you how many numbers was on the car. I couldn't tell you if I was the last one or not, but I know I was 107, so <laughs> there was a lot of cars. Yeah. I think it was over 120 cars that year just trying for the 36 spots in the snowball. Wow. And that's the year I happened to, what, 74? Uh, 75 was my first year. Yeah, 75, because I run second in 75. Okay. And, uh, that was it. It was your first year. My first year. Sure was. Tell me about the, your win. Tell me about your first win. <laughs> first one was in uh, '71. Now I was driving for Claude Miller on '36, and uh, it was uh, another protested. Race. Tell the story. <laughs> Tell the story. <laughs> no, no, is, this, is this the gas story? Was that a story? No, 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 story no, issue, no. I believe. No, the, ga the gas story came in my own car in '73. Uh, well, we're gonna hear that too. <laughs> But the first one was, you know, it was, uh, you know, when you when you win that race, it doesn't make no difference what year you won it, whether it's 70s, 80s, 90s, or 2000. It's the prestige of winning it. Yeah. 
Well, it's a huge deal, and it's like you're saying, I mean, a lot of the top-tier NASCAR guys will come down here and compete in this race. And, I mean, just in recent years, uh, and, and Tim, you jump in here, but I know Kyle Busch has, has won the race, and, of course, he's in Sprint Cup, was Sprint Cup champion last year, right? Uh, and then uh, Chase Elliott has won it twice. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, talk about the marquee names that show up. Eric Jones has also right. had two wins in recent years, and uh, now he's uh, in the Sprint Cup Series full-time, uh, or Monster. Uh, uh, NASCAR <laughs> series, whatever they're going to call yeah. it, 2017. But uh, and 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 to some degree, that's uh, that's why the event has really grown so much in, in recent years because a lot of these young drivers, and you know, we can all agree that they've gotten really young. But they're 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 looking for uh, an event that they can hang their hat on that'll that'll get them to the next level. And with uh, even you know, starting with uh, of course Kyle Busch won it in '09, Johanna Long. The last time a local driver won it was 2010, and then she went on to do some pretty amazing things in, in NASCAR. And then, of course, Chase Elliott with two wins, and Eric Jones with two wins, and John Hunter Nemechek uh, with a win. And all of those people are in, in uh, you know, NASCAR's upper upper levels now. So so the young guys are looking at that. They look at this race as perhaps, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's my day, uh, you know, great things are going to happen to me, and, it, and it's happened that way, but it's, uh, it's not always the case. I will tell you, uh, you know, one of the most amazing stories with the Snowball Derby is a guy named Rich Bickle who won the race five times in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's half of a decade. He, yeah. he won the race, and, and, and Rich did do some NASCAR racing uh, after that, but uh, for the most part, he was just a, a short track racer. And, and as Gordon mentioned, that's, that's really what this race is about. It's a, it's a short track race. We get the best short track racers in the country, and then you sprinkle in a little NASCAR flavor along the way, and it just makes it even sweeter. What's the difference of the skill set of what it takes to be successful on a short track like Five Flag Speedway versus what it takes to be successful at Daytona or Talladega or Charlotte? Well, nowadays they've got computerized out racing, and they get on there and they race on the racetrack that they're fixing to come drive at. So they know every bump and ripple on the track prior to being here, and they hop right in a little race car and they go. Well, the race car that most of these cats hop into nowadays has been on a seven-post pull-down machine. It's been on a chassis dynamometer, and it's built by a NASCAR team that just like a Winston Cup car. Right. And it's just it's all about dollars. That's now. just what we was talking about earlier about you know what I saw happen with the uh, car over at Tracy's shop. And when it had it all dialed in on the machines and everything, four-hour session, sixty-five hundred dollars. It's it's not a backyard sport anymore. <laughs> it's not backyard sport anymore. But sixty-five hundred dollars, and, and they got a break. Now. They got a break wow. on the price. But when you you're talking about engineers coming down, setting the car up, and all that, and all the computer stuff involved in it. Um, he got a good deal, 6500 and he qualified fourth or fifth. Yeah, and he, he qualified, made the qualified shot. well. And that's what, it, that's what it takes if you want to get up front. Well, the, <laughs> big, the big thing about the Derby now that I see, it's all about notoriety. It's all about the TV coverage. It's all about the ink that they get after this race is done. If they win, they run good. It, it doesn't matter if they win or they run good. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the ink. Gotcha. And the ink's what they're all about. The other side of that, is once they get that ink and everything, Daddy's still got to fund <laughs> that operation to get him going. Right. Because when Eric Jones won the race, yeah, Kyle Busch recognized him, but Daddy took checkbook to Kyle Busch's and he paid for that <laughs> truck ride and he paid for that Infinity ride until his contract gets signed with a top tier, say, Joe Gibbs team to in what is Sprint Cup now. Right. Then his path is paved because now he's on contract. Right. Is it difficult for a young guy that doesn't already have money behind him to make Very it in the difficult. racing business? Very Almost impossible. He'll, uh, stay, he'll stay right here on the local level. That's there are question. instances, though, uh, make no mistake about it, of, of guys that make it on talent alone, but they've got the ability to find money. Doesn't right. always have to be family money. Right. Uh, there's a, a, a guy that's an up and comer right now that. Uh, is, is, is under contract. He uh, uh, would be listed as a, as a Snowball Derby winner, only he didn't pass post-qualifying, uh, post-race technical <laughs> inspection in 2015. Of course, I'm talking about Christopher Bell. Christopher Bell didn't come from money. Um, there was a, uh, a, a kind of a scouting team out, uh, Toyota Racing Development, who's got some affiliation with Kyle Busch Motorsports, was looking for talented drivers. They, they were actually looking for talent, and Christopher Bell was one of them they recruited. So uh, that's, that's kind of an exception in today's world. 
Uh, and then, of course, there's guys that, that got the ability to attract the sponsors that may not have their own money. And, and you know, my advice to a, a young driver coming up today, you guys uh, chip in on this, but, uh, you know, you not only got to understand your race car, you got to have some driving ability and some, some real passion for, for what you do, but you've also got to be able to market yourself. Right. Because without that, uh, you're not the total package. Did Jeff Gordon change that whole dynamic? I think he had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna Long is a good example, too. Uh, you know, her dad, Donald, <laughs> You know, helped to bankroll her going up into the, uh, I guess, what the Infinity Series then, and uh, lasted what a year and a half, maybe two years. Then uh, couldn't really get a, a good sponsorship. Didn't have the great finishes and stuff like that. The money ran out, and she hadn't raced much since then. And you know what? The the, the really sad part about that is, and of course, uh, uh, I don't think Johanna's racing career is over. I'm understanding yeah. she may come back and run the Snowball Derby next year, uh, and she'll have her one-year-old uh, <laughs> daughter yeah, in tow. Yeah, yeah. but. Yeah. Uh, um, they were right on the edge. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Donald, uh, uh, you know, kind of carried her along the way, but uh, Johanna actually got pretty polished and was mm -hmm. so close to landing yeah. some big sponsorship, mm -hmm. and she'd have been on her way because she had the talent. Yeah, but uh, just just never really could close the deal, unfortunately. Interesting. It, it's uh, it's hard to, it's hard for anybody now to jump up if you don't have the financial money. Grand and finger. He's won ARCA races and everywhere, everything else, and it's just hard to make that next step. Yeah. And if you don't have a, if you don't have a good bankroll, it's kind of hard. I sometimes. think he's passed the window of age yeah. now. Well, yeah, yeah they're looking. You know, like, a like when you started racing in '75, you were 17. You were one of the youngest drivers out there, because I remember when, man, when. When I was racing 26 years old, they didn't want you to drive their car because they wanted to get somebody yeah, else. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, it's changed. It's a different world. We're having a very fascinating conversation about the Snowball Derby, and we are going to continue chatting with a handful of guys here who are heavily involved in the race in just a couple of moments. So we hope you'll stay with us. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, back in just a couple of moments. Watching in the studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, our guest, Wayne Niedekin Jr., Dickie Davis, Tim Bryant, and Gordon Paulus, and we are discussing the Snowball Derby, which is considered one of the nation's premier short track stock car races. Got some interesting picture for, pictures from Five Flag Speedway and from the Derby over the years, and uh, we're going to put some of those up on screen. I'll have you guys kind of tell some stories about them and talk about them. Uh, Dickie, I'll start with you on this one. That's uh, Claude Miller. I drove his car, the 36 cars, one and one, the first snowball. To it. That was uh, his car when he owned a Guff service station. He had a, he rented U-Haul it trucks, and that was his first race car, number 16. 
Boy, they sure have changed over the years. No windshield in there, right? <laughs> you know, as a, as a track promoter, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, gosh, what we would give to see guys come to the racetrack with that rig today. Because it was a billboard going down the highway. In today's world, they've got big stacker trailers. Most of them are white with no writing on the side. People just can't, uh, you know, tell what's inside those trailers. But uh, as a kid, I remember seeing those and how excited you'd get seeing something like that go down the road. And I promise you, you were on your dad to take you to the races. I, I bet, I bet. Tell me about these guys. It's the Alabama gang, and I recognize Bobby Allison and uh, Neil Bonnet there, and who else? Red Farmer, second from left, yeah, Donnie, ran the first through yeah. 32 uh, snowball derbies. Yeah. Okay. Still a record. Okay. And yeah, uh, Ron, uh, who was that? David Rogers is after it, though. No, yeah, he tied he's closing it. He's tied it. Yeah. I think he tied it this. Uh, right there, Davey. Uh, is that's that Clifford or yeah, Davey Allison? Davey Allison. That's Davey in the yeah. Bobby's car. Okay, yeah, that was Davey Allison who was the uh, who who had a great deal of success, uh, won the Daytona 500, uh, as a matter of fact, and was uh, tragically killed at Talladega International Speedway in a helicopter crash. Believe it or not, uh, odd story yeah. about Davey is uh, he he was not the greatest short track driver, but uh, once he made his way to the to the upper level, had instant success. Yeah. Probably one of the best there ever was. Well, his uncle chewed him out one night in Mobile, and there was a sh uh, over there. Donnie told him he hit everybody on the racetrack except the flagman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, his, his best finish at Snowball was 15th. Yeah. So that, that was right? his best finish ever. Wow. Yeah. But he did go on, as we said, and win the. He won the Daytona 500. Yeah. I think yeah. he won Talladega, and yeah, I, he had a good deal with Robert Yates. Yeah, he had a real good deal, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> Larry, uh, Larry, Larry McReynolds. Larry Mack was his crew chief. Yeah, man, they were all from Birmingham. Yep, yeah. right here. You. The picture there. Who's this guy? So <laughs> that's, a, that's a picture we looked at earlier, and we decided that this guy must have borrowed that trophy from the photo. This <laughs> is Tim. I was passionate about racing. I was never uh, uh, on the caliber of, of, of Junior or, or Dicky as far as uh, total number of wins. I managed to win a few races, even won one track championship. So I'm I'm proud of that. But uh, for the most part, I was a racer that just strived to be there every time they opened the gate. Yeah. But at one time, it. Uh, his two brothers and his dad all raced together at the yep. same racetrack at the yep. same night. Yep. No kidding. And he finished eighth in the Snowball Derby, <laughs> better than Davey Allison. So he got that thing I can down. put that on my yeah. resume. <laughs> we got a couple of more pictures we're going to put up here. Now, what? That's. Uh, Many years ago, and who is that's that? a car we, Buddy Baker drove yeah, at okay. Snowball Derby one year. He was at the at the height of his NASCAR stardom uh, when he came uh, to Pensacola that December. Seventy seven. Back in that area of racing, that was a late model sportsman car there that would run Hickory and they'd even probably run that car at Charlotte. Well, they could run. They could run. But back then, it, uh, it was nine pounds per cubic inch. Mm -hmm and like 112 inch wheelbase, you could go anywhere in the Southeast United States and be competitive mm -hmm. and, and run the show. And uh, all of them were like that. And that, that was really nice. You could go Montgomery, Birmingham, uh, Jackson, Baton Rouge, anywhere you wanted to go, you were in the ballpark at a racetrack. Okay, I don't think a lot of people are gonna recognize these two guys. Yeah, he was a tire changer for Waltrip that year. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let me put this in, in perspective here. That's uh, Daryl Waltrip, who is uh, in the in the race in the fire suit, and to the left of him is the legendary Dale Earnhardt. Right. So <clears throat> Earnhardt was down with Waltrip, who was running the Snowball Derby, and he was helping him change tires. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a crew member at that, he was at that point member. in time, and I thinking that Daryl probably wouldn't have been barking out orders like he was had he known where Dale Earnhardt Sr. was headed. Yeah, you know? wow. No, he later it. on gave him a ride, didn't he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> that's yeah. right, that's right. Daryl won 76, and he took the checkered flag another year, but was disqualified later on that night. He, but he was already it. on his way home with a trophy. He still has that second trophy and refuses to give it back. <laughs> Somebody he, had a speedy pin, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Some, his score apparently uh, kind of Made up the lap. uh, laps a little bit. He actually finished one or two laps down, and they figured that out later that night. But oh, uh, he wow. has a trophy. He still says he won two. Yeah, it was Bobby <laughs> and Charlie Grant both. They did the scoring back in those days, right. and it was what they called a flop clock. And it was a pretty complicated deal of scoring back in those days, <laughs> yeah. but it took a while to figure out who was what. Right. Uh, so he got the trophy and the check and headed out, huh? I don't know if he got the check, but he had the trophy. Yeah. So back in those days, to make a pit stop, you, you went around what we 
currently today called the quarter mile. It's the small track inside the track, and that's where they actually made the pit stops. They made a loop. And uh, if you had a score that was in the scoring stand, each car provided their own score, and they made a mark on a scoring chart as they come by. If you had a score that was really, really sharp with their timing, uh, wasn't too hard to pick up a lap. That's what happened there. <laughs> well, there again, it falls back to that NASCAR know-how. They, they had a little bit more know-how than the average person, and, and, and they got it no, done. No, there were some sharp ones around. That's there. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, of course, for people who don't know, Daryl Waltrip, uh, of course, he won three uh, Winston Cup championships, and he's also an announcer on uh, uh, Fox with uh, Jeff Gordon and uh, Mike. Um, Joy. Mike Joy, who's a wonderful broadcaster. I don't know why his name escaped me. You were talking about uh, a few minutes ago about uh, Johanna Long winning, but the first female to win the Snowball Derby, Tammy Jo Kirk. Tell that story. Well, I tell you, that uh, was a great story. She was a, uh, a motorcycle racer from uh, uh, up in the Atlanta area and came down here somewhat under the radar, but she uh, uh, had run on the all-pro circuit and so was, was fairly well known. And things just kind of fell, fell her way that day. Uh, to where, you know, as many snowball derbies evolved, that somebody's just in the right place at the right time at the end of the race. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, she had a rear view mirror full of Eddie Mercer on the final <laughs> laps. And, uh, you know, <laughs> thankfully, Eddie went on to win uh, at a later date. Year. 2000. Uh, 2005. That car was, yeah, that uh, was, back right. in, that was 11 yeah, years yeah, old. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> there was yeah. probably a time there where Eddie's probably thinking, wow, maybe I should have used that bumper. I'm not ever going to win this race. Yeah. But thankfully, he, he, could, yeah. he couldn't handle that pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I happened to be in the grandstands that day, and there was just a certain feeling that was going on. Was he going to do it or was he not going to yeah. do it? And I was hoping he was going to come to the program tonight because I just wanted to ask you the question. <laughs> I just, I, I, I wonder, had Junior Niedek been <laughs> leading and he were that close, would, it, <laughs> would they have ended up oh, in the wall, he, in the fence? Oh, he would have punted him. <laughs> most, of them, most of them were wrecking their mom to win that race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joanna Long turned someone at the end there to win that race, which is kind of ironic with Tammy Joe Kirk not getting turned by Eddie. Uh, uh, Joanna Long kind of was yeah. aggressive in the last yeah, lap she, to win she her race. Up ran, I mean, uh, Castle Eddie, a little bit Eddie, Eddie showed sportsmanship by yeah. not turning her. He yeah. did. I'll and he finished credit. fourth well, or finished yeah. second four times. Racing yeah. it, the race has really changed its face over the years because back when my dad and Davis and even Fryer and a lot of the others won, I would say all the way up until the late nineties. It was pretty much a gentleman's race. I mean, there was camaraderie, there was sportsmanship. You didn't see that roughing somebody. You know, they would rub them or to loosen them up or something, but it wasn't a blatant just drive through you. And nowadays, you see a blatant drive through you to win this thing, and it's just how prestigious this race has gotten to the point where, you know, the person that wins that race, they're looking at this is my chance for stardom. I might mm -hmm. make it to the next level if I win this show, and they're pretty desperate to win this race. Let's go back, though, because uh, you talk about that sportsmanship and camaraderie, and and uh, let's talk about Bobby Allison yes. and Ronnie Sanders. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was right in the middle of the time period yeah. you're talking about, you're absolutely right, about racers were – were generally, they, they didn't wreck each other back in those days. They'd, they'd race hard, but they didn't wreck each other. But on that particular day, I think I remember Ronnie Sanders uh, going to the pit with a wrecked car and getting a jack handle and running out on the back straightaway and chasing Bobby Allison down with it. So. Well, it was an axle because my yeah. ex-brother-in-law at the time went back there and he stopped him, and that was uh, Suitcase Ron, Ronnie Helton, what we called him <laughs> at that time. We called him Suitcase because he later crew chief for a bunch of different people. But that was when that went on. But... It, it could have been one of them three strikes in your out deals, too. You, you know, we don't know. I don't know. Because uh, that's the way Dad raced, and that's the way he brought me up to race. He goes, you know, you give him three chances. Third chance, you're mine. <laughs> 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 of course, you know, Bobby out the Allison brothers were involved in one of the big events in NASCAR that may have pretty yeah. much kind of turned the tide of the popularity yeah. when it definitely did. Back it did. In the first uh, live televised Daytona right. 500. That where made the sport. Yeah, yep. really did. Where uh, Kale Yarbrough and Donnie Allison on the on the back straight away. And Bobby, but look who kept the helmet on. Kale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was Bobby Allison's great line, Kale Yarbrough, <laughs> kind of taking his his face and beating it against my fist. Yeah, that's <laughs> a great line. I had a chance to interview Bobby a handful of years ago. What a what a what a nice gentleman he is. Um, now that he's no longer. Well, I'm just glad Bobby's who he is now. Yeah. 
from the bad wreck that he went through. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he mm -hmm. developed back to who he is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You were talking about that, Tim, as a promoter and as a track owner. How do you draw the line of, uh, you know, that's just racing and that guy, he, he really is out of bounds? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. You know, uh, we have a, a, a race director who, who oversees the, the race and, uh, you know, the, the policy basically is if you, uh, if you take somebody out intentionally, uh, you know, you're, you're penalized for it. And uh, uh, we, we've got to allow the guys a chance to race. But to determine, you know, whether, uh, whether it was intentional or was there, whether it was an accident is extremely hard. It's much like a, a, an umpire in baseball. You know, when the when the ball comes across the corner, is it a ball or a strike? So judgment always plays into it, and and ultimately, when the, when race control uh, is is brought in to make a call like that, you know, they're only going to be half right. So you know, it's kind of a, a no win situation. There's there's no uh, uh, perfect remedy for that. In our case, we've got a race director uh, uh, named Dan Spence who's been in this sport since uh, since I think before Junior started racing, and uh, you know he's. Uh, He's uh, developed a, a, a pretty strong reputation for being right most of the time, but I'll tell you, there's not a guy out there that's right every time. Sure, sure. Well, and, and the situation came up at the race last week, you know, the 49th, when Stephen Nassi got taken out with about 20 laps left by, was it Christopher Bell? No, it or, was uh, um, st uh, the other driver. Byron, I think. Yeah, yeah okay. Byron. Yeah, Byron, the pole sitter. Correct. And before the race director had a chance to make the call on if he was going to have to go back to the pack, Nasty just turned around in the caution and plowed into him and knocked him out of the race. Mm -hmm. So the race it, director never, I mean, it'd be, I'd been interested to see what uh, Dan would have made the ruling on that I've one. thought the same thing. <laughs> and I haven't talked to him about yeah, it. So, okay. uh, that was a call he didn't have to make. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Some great stories about the Snowball Derby. And there's a couple of legendary stories out there. One of them involving one of our guests, Dickie Davis. We're going we're gonna to put him on the spot and have him tell that story when we come back in just a couple of moments. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're back in just a couple of moments. Watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, the Snowball Derby. Our guests, Wayne Niedekin Jr., Dickie Davis, Tim Bryant, and Gordon Paulus. All right, Dickie, you're on the spot. You're on the clock here. There's a famous story about you and something to do with some fuel and fuel mileage. So tell the story. Oh, that was in the 73 <laughs> Snowball Derby. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, we had the Allisons, the Walters, and you had all the net. And you try to figure out how you go out, a local man, go out run the NASCAR guys. So, you know, we always got our fuel, uh, Junior's dad and I, we got the fuel from the same airport out there. We run aviation fuel. So I got to think, you know, I remember a long time ago, in the drag racing used to cool your gas down with ice and make the motor stronger, which that wasn't the point. The point was you can cool it down and the gas will shrink. When it heats up, it expands. So, you know, I put a 55-gallon drum of fuel from the airport and I put it on dry ice for a week in my shop. 
and so we got ready to go to the races. My gas was cold. My gas when it comes out of the ground is cold, and so it pretty cold, and so it made the 200. At that time, it was a 200 lap snowball. Right. So it made the whole race without uh, having to put gas in there. And uh, Ed Howe said that there wasn't no way in the world that you could run the whole race on 22 gallons. I had just bought that fuel cell from Bobby Allison about two weeks before that. I said, man, I hope he ain't sold me something that's been blown up. Because you know, they'll blow them up and stretch them out. And I said, Lord. But anyway, I took it down to the service station down there, and it held 21.6. So... Of course, I had a, a little motor from, <laughs> not a little motor, but it was a, a smaller motor than some of the other ones run. It was a D-stroke 400 out of Lee Hurley's place in uh, Birmingham. And I could weigh like 2,700 something pounds where the other guys run 350s to 355s were weighing 3,150 or, or 3,195. And so I had a little bit advantage there, but my motor was put out the same horsepower as the, as the big cubic inch. So I, I got lucky. <laughs> and, and you told me when a few years ago when we did the interview on that that if the race had started 30 minutes later you'd have been DQ'd because the gas had been spewing oh, yeah. all oh, out yeah, of your yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah we, it was a Sunday afternoon race and, and back then you know sometimes you have cold weather sometimes you have hot weather and uh, the gas will expand and I said Lord I need to get going. <laughs> See, something I didn't know Dickie, uh, uh, Ed Howe of course who had won in 1972 right. the previous right. year did he actually protest yeah, here? Or uh -huh. was yeah. He did? Oh, yeah. There was we had a protest. To go. We went all the way down to the uh, service station at Mobile Highway and Woody Fletcher's old place at Amoco. <laughs> went down there and they had drained Filled it. There wasn't no gas in it. Yeah. And so <laughs> they topped the hell 21.6 when it came out to overflow. So. <laughs> that was a relief, wasn't it? Who paid for the gas? <laughs> I, I, you know, I really don't know, but I was tickled slapped to death. <laughs> but it, it it worked out great. I always thought it was Larry Phillips that protested you because he I think he finished second to you. That it day. was Larry. It yeah. was it was Larry Phillips. Sure was. I thought it was Ed Howard. Ed sat on. Well, I mean they were all one in the they same. They all protested probably. <laughs> they were in the same well, area. No, Freddie, Freddie Fryer protested me the first time, and so uh, I said, "Well, that's all right." So, <laughs> but then when I went to go protest, I could have won my third one when Pete Hamilton. Won it in uh, '74 because mm -hmm. I run second behind him. Now, when I went to go protest him, I was five minutes late getting there. <laughs> oh, so, oh, and no. then he got found. He had that nitrous oxide in there because I said, "Man, ain't no way uh, got." Because we he dominated run. that race. Oh, he did, yeah. man. And when he sh when they dropped that green flag again on the restart about 10, 15 laps ago, he shot out like a bullet. I said, "Ain't no way." And so, but he had that little container. Yeah. I never heard that. And the year before, he had been cued. And he yeah. was so mad, he, right. he was bound to turn right. to win the next and year. Would. And he, and, uh, he was yeah. driving Doug Robinson's car out of uh, Texas. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Tell you, Gordon's got some stats over there, Jeff. And uh, 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 one stat that I bet he doesn't have is Dickie Davis's record. Because he didn't run that many snowballs, but his average finish is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Dickie started six snowball derbies, and his first four finishes were first, first, second, and second. Wow. Amazing. Imagine and that I, for four I, stars. I, I, what was yeah. you, what, and I apologize for not giving you credit for having that. <laughs> he is the stat what, man. What was the key to your success? Uh, you know, it takes a lot of luck, and I had a lot of, you know, well, I had a good engine builder in Birmingham, and then the second two times that I run second, I drove two different cars. For some, uh, I drove uh, Bernie Morrison's car, number 40, and then I drove Percy Brow's car, number 80, and... Uh, that's, I, that's the two years I run second. Then I drove my own car the last two years, and I sat on the outside pole and I, with a Dixon uh, Brothers car that I got in, built in California, and I said, you know, I'm going to win my third one. So, <laughs> man, I was celebrating being on the outside pole. That's the closest I ever got. And so, anyway, I went off to eat and party or whatever, and the crew took, because the throwout baron was raising little sand, so I said, don't worry about it, because once we shift, it's all right. They took it back to the shop and worked on it and messed up the shifter, and so when they started the race, I could go through first and second, but when it went to third and fourth, it, it was, wasn't there, so, oh, you know, so I, I wound up running 21st that year, so. Wow. What was it like running against his dad? You raced his it, dad? It, yeah, his dad and I, we, now, 
usually he and I would be in the helmet dash and we'd joke around. And one time, uh, let me a, get you explain what the helmet dash is. The helmet quick, dash is the two fastest cars on a on a weekly show. They run the helmet dash, and uh, <clears> you know back then they had the helmet dash, and then they had the fast heat, and then the feature. And uh, Wayne would either win it or I'd win it. So we had a bet one time for a dollar. It was a big bet <laughs> <laughs> for a dollar. I think I collected a dollar. Didn't I, Junior? Did I win the dollar? That's like Jimmy Grimes. I used to make more money betting him when I'd outrun his car than I did winning the heat race. <laughs> you mean he bet even back then? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like? You raced against your dad, right? What was I that did. like? Well, the cars come out of the same stable, and you made sure that you raced clean. You didn't want to touch your dad, right? Because right. you sure didn't want to have that to come back home to. <laughs> right, right. And uh, you know it was a little intimidating on top of that. Yeah. You know because of who he was and what he had meant to racing and what he had achieved in in his years of racing. You know, growing up watching him race, and uh, so I just always made sure I raced dad real clean. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get. Close to that, and you know, and the money went to the same household, so you know we'd make a show out of it. Right. We always made a show out of it. Right, right. Well, he was uh, quite uh, quite a legend in short track racing around here, wasn't he? Dad achieved yeah. a whole lot in racing. I mean, prior to probably the, the uh, full body cars, he he ran super modified cars, and built his own cars, <clears throat> built everything about it. And uh, there was a race in Houston, Texas, and Jim Grimes and uh, Allen. I can't remember what Alan's last name is. Lettered all the race cars. Martin. Alan, Alan Martin. Martin. Yes. Alan was pilot. And I think Jim owned the airplane. And they flew Dad. We raced here on Friday night. Our dad raced here on Friday night. And they flew Dad out to uh, Houston, Texas to run the Liberty Bell 300. And Dad wound up winning that race wow. when they flew him out there. And it was his 13th try. And he had w dominated that race for years and years and the track was so rough that the radiator would fall out of the car and just crazy things would happen and just always something would break yeah. right towards the end of the race and he finally won the race and he said that's it we're not going back <laughs> uh. i have a good recollection as a, as a kid when i first started coming to the races over here wayne Niedek and senior was my my hero you know, I go to school on Monday with a hoarse voice from screaming for Wayne on Friday night. Oh, that was his hero. And, and part of the reason, well, well, you ranked right up there. Yeah. I, I was going for the 99. Wow. But I will tell you about Wayne, and, 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 you know, Junior mentioned earlier about what a savvy racer he was. Back in those days, as Dickie mentioned, it would be a helmet dash in a, in a, in a, in a heat race, and uh, they'd generally have a consolation. And then they'd have a feature, 25 laps. Well, the fastest cars always started in the rear. Well, that was Wayne. He had to come from the back. I hardly ever remember him taking the lead in a race before two or three to go. And, I mean, I think that's why he built such a fan base. I mean, it was not unusual on a Friday night out there for a full grandstand to be on their feet, uh, you know, seeing whether it be Wayne on that night or Dickie on, on some night taking the lead uh, late in the race. Unlike today's races where... Uh, and it pains me to say this because, you know, to some degree we've uh, uh, been a part of it. But today's racers, they don't want those complete inverts. They, uh, they say, oh, I can't start in the rear, you know. <laughs> so nowadays we have a, a top six or a top eight uh, invert, something like that. And it's not unusual for, for the guy that wins the race to lead half the race. So we miss that element of race, yeah. and I think we'd but all it agree. Is, uh, it was, back then it was hard because like on a Friday night, here or Saturday night mobile, you had 25, 30, 32 cars start a feature. I mean, a regular mm -hmm. weekly show. And it, you had to start in the back. You had 25 laps to get to that checkered flag, and sometimes it wasn't easy. What would keep people from just sandbagging? Oh, yeah, we had some good well, ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a rule. I mean, they had a, a quarter-second breakout. So if you, uh, uh, if you ran faster during the race than, than what you qualified, you'd get the black flag. Yeah. Okay. okay. Jimmy Kitchens. Uh, was the best. They called him Sandman. That was his nickname. He'd sandbag every week just to start up front. See, then you had to catch him. Uh. Let me say one thing about Wayne over here as far as the snowball history. He raced probably 28, 30 snowball derbies. Best finish was second in 1990. And I remember the years, you know, when uh, Tammy Joe Kirk won, the crowd went wild, you know, Joanna Long, uh, Eddie Mercer. But if, if you'd ever taken that checkered flag, I think the biggest roar 
the Snowball Derby would have ever had was when you, if you'd have won. And yeah. I, I wish I could have seen that happen. Yeah. Well, I tried this. I know. You did. <laughs> just never made yeah. it. Yeah, that, I know. That, that'd been the only father-son deal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that'd been yeah. a good deal. And, and sometimes just a matter of things that doesn't fall your way because you won everything else. <laughs> well, I, I probably had 10 opportunities to win that race and just little things would occur during the event. I remember one year in particular, I run third pretty much all day long. And uh, the car was stuck in high gear after the first restart. So I had no low gear. <laughs> and when you come in for a pit stop, you had to hold your foot on the clutch and the brake and keep the car running. And the car, the last pit stop of the day, and this was on the quarter mile, and the the quarter mile was full of holes right. at that particular, in that particular era, they hadn't repaved the pit road. So your jack's in a hole, possibly, which in this particular case it was. <laughs> and the car rolled forward just a little bit. And when it did, the jack collapsed under the car and left side tires were off, and the car fell oh, on the man. ground. Well, I had a good friend from Louisiana helping me on the crew that day. And this young man, he was probably, I'd say he's 280 pounds. And he deadlifted the car by himself. And all I could hear was, get the jacket, get the jacket. <laughs> you know, this was pre-radios, no yeah. radios back in this time, oh, wow. still. And uh, they got the jacket under the car. And after that race, I went up to him. And I said, do not ever <laughs> let me say anything bad to you. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. We are talking about the Snowball Derby, and you're hearing all the fun stories on In Studio here on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We'll continue our great discussion here in just a couple of moments. Hope you'll stay with us. This is In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're talking stock car racing, primarily the Snowball Derby. Our guests, Wayne Niedekin Jr., Dickie Davis, Tim Bryan, and Gordon Paulus. Dickie, tell me about your days as a deputy sheriff. You got in trouble for racing, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> got in trouble with a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, well, that's when uh, we built, I built, well, Nick L and I built that 57 Ford, and we had uh, some... Saul Stewart was furnishing the big Ford motor stuff for us and all that. And we were doing pretty good. We couldn't handle in a 40-acre field, but we run good. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, I got in uh, trouble with racing. So the sheriff at that time told me that uh, it was conduct unbecoming an officer. So I had, to, you know, I said, Lord, I know I've got half owner, owner of a race car, now I'm going to get in trouble. So I was going to get suspended if I keep racing. So I decided I'd go out of town. I was racing under a... Cotton Davis was the name, <laughs> and so I was racing Mobile, and, and so I won a race, and so they put my picture in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> so newspapers. Got, yeah, yeah. yeah. The newspaper got me, to, uh, Mobile Press, <laughs> and so uh, it got back over there, so uh, I took a week's suspension for that, for disobeying an order and all that stuff, but anyway, it worked out. I, I, 
sold my car part of the race car out, and the car made the snowball derby with Armin Holly driving it, the, the yellow 57 Ford. But uh, that ended that part of my career. And then the next <laughs> sheriff came in. Uh, he let me go ahead and do what I wanted to do. So okay. then I started racing for Fred Moore. Didn't Gordon, any more yet. Who's, who's the most fascinating personality you covered over the years? At the Snowball Derby, there were so many of them, but I'm going to have to say Dickie Davis, <laughs> followed by Wayne Lee Deacon Jr., and then Tim Bryant. All right, <laughs> uh, I'm third again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so many characters. I mean, you, you got a guy like Onion McSwain who raised, yeah. you know, uh -huh. uh, Rat Lane, you know, those oh, yeah. local drivers and stuff. You know, Gary Sainamont, I think, was one of the more unique drivers that, you know, he won a couple of races. He was a nice guy. He was a very nice very guy, nice smart guy. driver. He, and, you know, we had the closest finish in Snowball Derby history last week, but Gary Sainamont was involved in the two previous closest finishes before that. And you think if he'd have won those two races, one of them was against Rich Bickle, he'd have more wins or be tied with Rich Bickle for most wins if he'd have pulled those two out. Amazing. Gary so, St. Amant's a great guy. Good, interesting story about Gary St. Amant. One year uh, that he went on to win the race. I can't remember exactly what year it was, but there was a, a red flag during a race while they cleaned up a, an accident scene and they stopped the cars on the back straightaway. Well, that was before there was a wall there. Well, they <laughs> sat there for a while and Gary St. Amant had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so out of his car he comes, standing on the ledge, facing north on uh, to the to the woods, north of the track, and and uh, you know did did what he had to do, and got back in his car, went on and won the race. I think probably Gordon, that'd be the only guy that's ever done that. I, uh, probably, I had that in my mind when you were talking about him. I'm like, yeah. that's right, because the racetrack, Five Flags Speedway, for the longest time, did not have a wall around it. You know, right. the, the Spears family uh, constructed the wall around, around the Speedway, and, and, and that family uh, deserves a lot of credit yeah. mm -hmm. for, for bringing uh, the, the track, yeah. and, and the, in particular the Snowball Derby, uh, to where it is. They, uh, they are the ones that first started selling reserve tickets, mm -hmm. and uh, um, when Terry Spears was there, they, they had a, a party down at Seville Quarter prior to the event, and, and uh, you know, everything's kind of evolved from that. So, uh, you know, those, uh, those folks get, get, get a good share of the credit for, for helping the Snowball Derby come to where it's at. And I got a trivia question. <laughs> okay. Last driver to go off the track in the Snowball Derby race before the wall was put up. Local driver. Oh, Ooh, goodness me. sakes. <laughs> yeah. uh, was it Rick Crawford? No, Clay Brown. Oh, really? Yeah, turn off the back stretch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep, yeah. yep. Next year they put up the wall. I you worked on that car recently. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah. Put a front clip on well, that. The guy that put the wall up was Tommy. What was it? Tommy Ruff. Tommy oh, Ruff. He, yeah. was a, he was a driver. Rough and, and ready. Was, yeah, yeah, rough and ready. He did the concrete wall all the way around there. I think he hit it later too. Yeah. 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 He had the correct name. Yeah. Make sure his work was good. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's a solid wall. Tommy yeah. was rough. Uh, <laughs> you raced on that track with the wall or without the wall. What's it? What, what was it like once the wall went up? Hard. <laughs> I think I've destroyed three race cars on that wall, and the last one I destroyed knocked me out. Really? Yeah, yeah I took a little, oh, well, I almost took a trip to the hospital. Mm -hmm. It did go later, but uh, it was pretty hard. <laughs> I can remember when they, when they built the wall, and uh, uh, I think I was on my way to the track for the first time to, to, to race, and uh, uh, I happened to be in a conversation with Junior on the phone, and I said, well, do you think, you know, is it going to change the groove? And his answer, I'll never forget it. He says, well, it shouldn't. They didn't move the asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Of course, uh, I no, that, bump, that dip's still on the outside. I'm going in turn three down there. <laughs> so for people who are not necessarily, uh, you know, huge race fans or know a lot about the ins and outs of the racing, give folks an idea. How fast are you going? And, and, and I'll keep it to the late models. So the Snowball Derby cars, how fast are you going? I would say the late models, the super super late model cars, when you lift nowadays, you're probably running 120 to maybe a little more than that Lord. when you lift. And uh, I, the whole thing about racing now is momentum. It's about <laughs> how little you can slow that car down, keep it going, keep it rolling without touching that brake too much. And I always like to trail break so I can settle the car. But the kids coming in nowadays, <laughs> you know, they haven't experienced that concrete like a lot of the veterans, and they'll run through there, and they might not even touch that brake. 
They probably run, I, I'd be, because the average speed on the pole setter this time was 111 mile an hour, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Okay. I imagine they doing 130 down the straightaway before they dive off in there. Cause I said, you well, know, with the sealed motors and all, I, I don't know. I, I would have to say it probably 120, 125, somewhere in there. Yeah, the corner speeds are probably not as slow as, as what some people might think. Because, it's there. Uh, with the technology in these cars today, uh, you know, the, the, there's so much grip on these cars. I mean, they don't, they don't slow down much. A pro car, you know, people frown on the pro cars and they, you know, they look down on them because they're a little bit lesser. They run a crate motor mm -hmm. in them. But you run faster through the corner in a pro car than you will in a supercar. And why is that? And because you, there's no motor. It's less motor. Slower. And we're running <clears throat> within two tenths most of the time of what a supercar runs. With a lesser car, with a lesser motor, not car. Cars are the same, exact same. Motors are probably 100, 125 horsepower shy of the supers, or what everybody's claiming. Right, right. And the whole thing is keep the car wound up. Keep it, you know, and you're, you're chipping it. The, those motors, all the motors nowadays run on a rev limiter. So you'll hear, if you go to the racetrack, you'll hear them, what it sounds like a stutter. And it's at the end of the straightaway. Well, the ideal thing is to have it geared to launch off the corner and pull the momentum as deep as you can down the straightaway to the lift point, lift, try not to touch the brake, let the car roll off in the corner, pick it back up, mat it. And everybody's trying to mat it. There's, mm -hmm. there's openings, what we gauge by, there's openings where you come into the pits off the track for entrance and exit like tow vehicles, that sort of thing. Right, right. And everybody is trying to lift as late as possible. So you're lifting before, just before the end of the wall and you're back on the gas before that opening. Wow. It's and we're talking yeah. like 1001 and you're on it. Yeah. Wow. When you hear drivers on TV talk about hitting their marks, right. that's exactly what they're that's talking about. That's what they're about. talking about. We could have a whole show just on that. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Unfortunately, I've got less than two minutes. Re just real quick, like, uh, Vicki, <laughs> what are you up to these days? In I'm retired. I've been, I've been retired for uh, 12 years and I just do what I need to do every day. Get up. <laughs> Get up. Gordon, how about yourself? I still follow racing. I go to Daytona, I go to Bristol and, and Five Flags as often as I can and, and I'm looking forward to the 50th anniversary race next year. Junior? That ought to be a heck of a race. I look forward to it. You going to be in it? I don't know about the big show, but we'll probably be in the local, okay. on the snowball heat. Okay, so you're going to continue to race on a local level? Well, I tell everybody I own the cars, I own the equipment, you know, and I'm dumb enough to still do this, so I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I'll get you to wrap it up here, guy, in you know, about 45 seconds or so. What are you looking for in the 50th year? Well, I tell you, we uh, we couldn't be prouder of, of, of where the event has gone and, 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 and how our community has embraced it, and, and all of these guys have certainly played a role, uh, has, has, as has all the competitors, so... Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we've we set the bar as a group. We've set the bar kind of high. So uh, we've got uh, some, some great expectations for a, a, a 50th anniversary Snowball Derby, and we're going to work hard to try to achieve them. Thank you all. Fascinating conversation. I enjoyed it. Absolutely enjoyed it. Our guests this evening have been Wayne Niedekin, Jr., Dickie Davis, Tim Bryant, and Gordon Paulus. Our topic has been short track stock car racing, primarily talking about the celebrated Snowball Derby, which, by the way, will celebrate its 50th anniversary in December of 2017. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon.